Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Dean Carlin, a professor of economics at Yale University and president and founder of Innovations for Poverty Action. IPA is a research and policy nonprofit that discovers and promotes effective solutions to global poverty problems. Since its founding in 2002, IPA has worked with over 400 leading academics to conduct more than 600 evaluations in 51 countries. This research has informed hundreds of successful programs that now impact millions of individuals worldwide. Today, we talk with Professor Carlin about a program he designed to raise ultra-poor households out of extreme poverty to a more stable state. Welcome, Professor Carlin. Hi, great to be here. Let's begin with an overview of the program that you developed. Tell us about it. Sure. So one, one slight correction, just for the record, is I didn't design the program. Okay. Um, um, what the, you know, one of the questions we get a lot mm -hmm. um, in, in this space, both, and both, and I say this both within academia, but also certainly when I'm talking with people outside of academia is, so what's the answer? What's the, you know, what's the cause of poverty? And, or what's the solution? And the reality is, you know, there isn't one single solution. And the problem with poverty, the, what got us here in this first place, is a multitude of different factors. Mm -hmm. Now, that can be talked about at a grand level, at a country level. But what this program is doing is tr trying to take that way of thinking at a micro level, at the household level, and saying, what are the issues at the household that might keep a household in a trap so that they just can't escape that poverty trap? And it's just it's a self-fulfilling trap. And so the, the program says, well, what if the problem is many things? And so the issue with other ideas that have been put forward in the past, like microcredit or a training program, or even just a simple cash transfer program, is that it's only hitting one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. It's just taking one issue, dealing with that. But when you have all these other issues, you, you don't get out of the trap. These other things still bind and they still hit and they make it so you're not as effective with the one thing that is being done. So this program, which is called the graduation program, is its, its name that some people gave it, says, let's do six things. Let's do them all at once, and let's make a big push at the household level with this idea that if we do this, mm -hmm. and we see this nice short run blip up, do we see it in the long run? Does it sustain itself? Do we see people actually kind of out of this trap? So the six things that it does mm -hmm. are, um, the, at the heart, is a productive asset. By a productive asset, I mean something that generates income. Okay. So it might be four goats. It might be beekeeping in Ethiopia. It was a cow in India. Mm -hmm. Usually it's an animal, but in, all, in some cases it's something that's not an animal. But it is an asset, an asset that is given to the household, not, not lent, mm -hmm. usually around two to $300 of value. They also provide consumption support, some food, so that the immediate thing you don't do when you get those goats is slaughter one of them oh, to eat it, right. and instead you rear them so that they can have kids and, and, on, sure. and, and start generating income. <clears throat> access to a savings account, training in, in whatever that asset is and how to rear it properly and, and have a sustainable income source. What we would call life coaching, which is a little bit nebulous and took, takes on different forms in the way it's implemented, but it basically consists of a weekly household visit from the nonprofit that is implementing the program, mm -hmm. or it could be government that implements this as well, um, to work with the household both to I identify issues they're having and make a plan. What are the steps you need to take? to get from A to Z. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then a weekly visit to kind of work through those issues with the household. Um, and access to a savings account, I think yes, I, you said, mentioned I did that. mention that one already. Mm -hmm. And then there's one more. Oh, um, a little bit of health um, intervention. Um, it might be deworming pills. It might be some access to clean water. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually not enough where that alone is thought of as a linchpin of the program. But right. no doubt, they're identifying some health issues and able to right, provide right. some service along the way. So it's all these things at once mm -hmm. is basically the program. OK, and what countries are you working in? So when we started this program, it had already started a bit in Bangladesh before us. Um, and we saw some early results there that looked very promising, mm -hmm. which is part of what got us excited about this being something to, to, to test. One of the divides that we have, or the problems within academia, I would say, is that we don't have enough incentives to do replication, mm -hmm. to, to see what are, you know, let's not just do it one place and, and then think that we've answered some grand question for the world. Right. Um, let's do it in many places, and let's try to start understanding something more concrete about the bounds within which something is going to work. Mm -hmm. um, so Ford Foundation and this group called CGAP, which is an, um, a, a donor consortium that's housed at the World Bank, 
approached us to say, you know, here's this interesting program that we've been familiar with. What do you think of the idea of doing this in six places? Mm -hmm. And so that's basically what we did. It took a long time to get the six all together, but we okay. did implement this in Honduras, Peru, Ghana, Ethiopia, India, and Pakistan. Okay. And so the evaluation that we were able to do, testing this basic idea and implementation across these six places, um, was able to move much faster into policy because we do find, bottom line is the answer is very positive, we do find successful outcomes. Okay. Um, and these outcomes persisted all three years after the assets were transferred. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more to learn about how to make it better, right. but the overall message was very powerful and, and having the six made it part of what made that message powerful. Being able to go into policy conversations going, no, 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 no. We're not just taking this one study from one place and claiming like voila, you know, it's going to work this everywhere, everywhere. Right. We did it in six, and and that um, and that gave us a lot more confidence and right. and, and and grounding to. And there's six very policy. different countries. There's six very right. different countries. There are there are some common aspects to all of them, um, in terms of the way it was implemented. Mm -hmm. First of all, the program was designed to be um, very similar, although there are adaptations that are natural that have to, you know, it's cows in India, but it's not cows in Honduras. Right. Um, they are all were done in rural areas, which is important if one wants to think about this approach in an urban setting. Probably a different set of issues need to be dealt with, and so it would look a bit different. The right. theory might be the same, that these kind of multiple constraints all interacting, needing to be a bit holistic about how you work on these issues at the household level. Where, uh, predominantly, um, where are these households who are the poorest? I mean, I had read a statistic, there are a billion people who are living on a dollar right. and a quarter a day. So are they predominantly in rural areas or in yeah. cities? So you, you, know? do, you do have a lot of ultra poverty in cities and it mm -hmm. looks very different. These, these studies were all done in, in rural areas. Um, and one of the things that these studies were doing in the very beginning is the intake process to identify, it wasn't the study doing this as much as the design of the program, mm -hmm. is that the, um, the intake process to be eligible for the program First, the first step was a what's called a participatory wealth ranking, mm -hmm. which is basically a community coming together and talking about the issues of poverty in their community and identifying who, which households are the poorest. Wow, okay. Right? And um, so a lot of other programs which have historically aimed or made arguments about reaching the poorest, like microcredit, have typically not actually reached the poorest. They've reached poor households. But, but there's actually a tranche below where they often will reach mm -hmm. um, that are not helped by things right, like right. Um, microcredit. And so this program is trying to reach to, to, um, to those, the, the only real filter that does weed out some of the poorest would be that if you're going to transfer beekeeping um, assets, which is, you know, hives and things like this right. to help a household in rural Ethiopia get started with a beekeeping business, they have to have the physical capabilities to do that. Mm -hmm. And you know, so realistically, if a household, if the members are too old or sick, um, there's other issues that need to be done in, in, from a humanitarian perspective, right. but it's not gonna be helpful to hand them um, a, 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 a livelihood that they're not actually physically gonna be able to do. Right. And so, so those people are often excluded from the program as mm -hmm. it's been rolled out and, and then other, other programs hopefully can help there. How, uh, who do you have working with the families? Do you, do you pick people who are already living in the countries to, you know, train them and then evaluate right. them? Right. How does that work? So there's, so first of all, there's a, there's, a, there's a clear separation, which is important you, um, as much as possible between the implementing parties and the research. Um, so at the research is managed by IPA for all of the field operations, and IPA has invested a lot historically in all the different countries we work to develop um, capacity in the country mm -hmm. um, with local nationals who are able to manage the field work, manage the survey, and, and, you know, and promote from, from, from within in that way. And that's um, important both for the quality of the work we're doing, the stability of the work we're doing, and also so that the work itself has that kind of impact on, mm -hmm. on the education and right. system and, and the capacity within country because we see that some of our alumni who worked with us and are off doing other things in government, and we can see the impact from our, our work in that way, and right. it's exciting to see that. So that's that's on the research side. The the ones that are actually working with the households, um, that's in each case is a different answer for who did that. Mm -hmm. um, and usually it was in um, it was a, a, a local NGO was basically partnered with. I see. Um, in Honduras and Peru, it was Plan International that then um, operated on the ground. In Ghana, 
um, we identified a local nonprofit called Presby Agri that mm -hmm. we had worked with in the past and um, had a really good set of field staff who were very, um, you know, understand the issues of the households they're dealing with and, and they're, they've taken on many different projects that are uh, different, they're not just agricultural. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were a good partner. In Pakistan, it was actually four different nonprofits. Um, in India, it was a nonprofit arm of a microcredit organization. Each one has a different story to it. Right. The one thing I would say that was important is when you have to think about what the path to scale is. So a lot of time you do the research because you're trying to test an idea, mm -hmm. and you might learn something, and that's great, but then you have to say, okay, so now if we want to see this change the world in some way, um, there's, a, there's a particular way of asking this question that I, I, I stole from Kevin Starr, who's um, have, head of the Milago Foundation, which I like, which is to say, who needs to do what differently? So you have to figure that out mm -hmm. when you have any sort of evidence you think could actually be used. Okay. Um, and when you want to start thinking about how do you take something to scale, ask that question of yourself. Um, so in this case, when you ask that, you're looking at social protection uh, in the government mm -hmm. because you're really dealing with something that, that is at scale and requires a lot of money. Right. So this is, this is really a government. So even though these programs were tested by nonprofits, that was, uh, we see it as proof of concept. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were actually operated at decent scale. So these are not tiny little pilots that are, um, that are you know, small and cozy. These were actually fairly large programs. Mm -hmm. But it takes another leap to go from there to the entire country. And for so that, you need government. The government needs to be involved. Exactly. Okay. And the government was involved in kind of observing the results as they came out mm -hmm. and along the way. And there were annual conferences in which we were sharing early designs, early results, things of this nature. So can you point to any countries who really embraced the work that was done and moved forward and um, created policy around the findings? So the two that stand out so far, I think we're up to about 8 million households now that have been now part of this program after the results came out mm -hmm. that are now part of government scale up. Um, Ethiopia and Pakistan in particular. Um, there are states within India that are now expressing interest and we're trying to start work there. But we've actually seen um, something in the order of um, 25 to 35 different um, conversations along the way. In the Philippines we've been talking with, they're doing something that's similar but not exactly this. And so one interesting question then for them to figure out is, okay, well what you're doing is similar, it's not this, here's what's been tested elsewhere. Maybe what you're doing actually would work better, but this is where you know, setting up a test would really help them learn. Right. And so that's the conversation in the mm -hmm. Philippines. Um, I'm heading in two weeks to Guyana, um, and um, the government of Guyana saw the results and reached out to us and said, how do we, how can we learn from this to mm -hmm. set our policy? So, you know, we're that's seeing it in big yeah. countries and, and small countries right. too. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so, were there any surprises along the way? And, and I ask this because I know you also just published a book called Failing in the Field yeah. and looks at some um, interesting case studies yeah. of things not to do perhaps yeah. in the yep. field. Yep. Yeah, this is a very cathartic book for me to write. <laughs> um, got to, like, so, the, um, you know, it's, 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 it's almost trite to say this, but it's true. We've got to learn from our failures, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's fun to talk about the successes. There's no doubt. I much prefer to go and give a public talk and talk about this program. Um, it feels great, it's exciting, it, it, it's so, but you know, we gotta learn from failures too. Roughly speaking, it's, it's important to think about three types of failures. Mm -hmm. There's idea failures, implementation failures, and research failures. Um, obviously, there's probably a wider category, but in my space, in my thinking, it's sure. those three. So an idea failure is when, well, it turns out that was a good idea, but it didn't work. You know, so the idea was wrong, something was off. Mm -hmm. um, the two that I'll focus on in to answer your question are implementation failures and research failures. So in the six sites, one of them didn't work. So the, what I just told you was all excited. I didn't go through details. We don't mm -hmm. have charts and right. stuff. Um, but if I did show you country by country, you would see that five of the sites looked really good and one not so. And we actually saw a negative effect. It wasn't statistically significant, so I'll just call it zero. Okay. This was in Honduras. Mm -hmm. The asset that was provided were chickens, and they got sick and died. Um, in hindsight, um, I think you know, um, I think it was a thought-through decision. But I think we, one of the thing we learned from that is you, we really we need to really make sure that the assets that are chosen to promote, because you, you give households choices in the way this program runs. Sure. Um, but it's a constrained set. It's four choices. Right. Um, and if it's something new, really make sure that it's good. <laughs> what what are the, what are the risks and returns of that asset? Chickens can be really profitable, but also much riskier. And when the virus hits or some bug hits, and uh, it wipes, so them, it out, wipes yeah. them out. So it was, it was a humanitarian failure. Um, but we actually did learn something important from it. We learned the importance of 
transferring that asset as the linchpin of the program. Mm -hmm. And if that asset doesn't work, it, the program did not work. Right. A research failure, and this is what the book is about, is when, no, we didn't, we didn't learn <laughs> something useful for the world about what to do and what not to do. We learned what not to do as a researcher. We learned that you, um, if you are going to set up a randomized trial and your code for randomization is flawed, you end up with a bad study. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that happens in a real rush and you gotta be careful. We learned that if you're doing a survey and you want to do a test within your survey by reversing the order of questions, that this can be really useful for learning. Mm -hmm. But if you screw up on the coding, you screw up and you don't get, and so we did this. We, we randomized the ordering of questions because we wanted to know if it mattered. And instead of randomizing the order, we actually just dropped half the questions. Okay. And it was just a coding error. But you know, if we don't document these things and point out that like, look, going to electronic coding can open up some doors, but you gotta be careful. Sure. There are some that are much more about partner management failures where um, we didn't really fully take into account all of the challenges that our partner was gonna face. Um, and so we were testing the integration of of a training program along with a credit program. But the credit officers, the training thing was this thing on the side for them. Their priority is getting repayments. Okay. And they weren't, even though senior management said, no, 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 we want to make the training an important part, they didn't actually compensate the employees um, with any sort of metrics and outcomes of actually doing the training. Instead, the compensation was all on repayment. So what ended up happening was it didn't take long for any time any default to happen or to be at risk of default, the credit offers just, just stopped the training and didn't do it. Right. So the whole, the research just fell apart and there was nothing to learn. There was no, there's no report at the end of the day. There's no mm -hmm. academic paper, there's no policy report. We learned nothing other than what not to do as a research project. And so that's been, um, you know, we've had some successes, but we've also had a lot of those projects right. and we need to document these and learn from sure. them. So we wrote this book where we collected a bunch of our stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we also have been working with the World Bank Development Impact Blog. Mm -hmm. Um, to post stories on there, so we're encouraging people mm -hmm. to try to do that as well. Are you working at all with the UN and their goals for sustainability? Um, um, so we have, so I mean, IPA does have some projects. I have one project with them personally, you know, with UNICEF, mm -hmm. uh, not the, the larger institution, in Ghana. I don't know the full slate of all the other right. projects. Um, the sustainable development goals, I think, um, you know, Just because you're yeah. working on the poverty issue, and I know right. that's a huge UN issue, so that's why I was wondering if there's any overlap so, there. Um, there's certainly a lot of overlap in interest. There's also a UN group called Better, Ca Better, Better Than Cash Alliance, which would, which is promote, trying to promote mobile money, and we do have a lot of studies that are trying to understand more about what the impact of mobile money is, as well as how to make it work right. Mm -hmm. You um, mean the microfinancing part of? of giving people small loans and having them? Um, well, one of the things with a, with a, with a cell, mobile money refers to actually um, 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 having effectively a bank account via okay. your cell phone. And, um, and actually, developing countries, are some of them are much further ahead than the United States on this. So in the United States, we can use Venmo or PayPal, mm -hmm. um, but, um, but we still have to fund those through a credit card or a bank account. In a developing country, particularly Kenya is like the, the poster child for um, kind of the earliest launch and expansion of mm -hmm. this. There's agents throughout the, throughout the country now where you can just walk up, give them cash, um, and then it basically gets deposited onto an account and on your cell phone you can do a few clicks and oh, see okay. that I have $12 and then I can send you the $12. I see. And you might live halfway across the country and so it's an easy way for me to send you money. Right. The, next, the next phase that we're seeing is a big push to say, okay, great, now that you can easily move money around, how about saving more? Let's make it so that you can automate savings. And then the next step from that is, now that you, s you're, you can actually get loans much more easily and pay loans more easily, so you can lower the cost for banks for reaching people, right. and you can make it really simple. Three clicks and you get access to a loan. That's actually a really exciting opportunity in terms of just lowering transaction costs. Three clicks, you get a loan. Right. It's also a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> Three clicks, you get a loan. Like, did you really know the interest rate and all the terms and how you're going to repay that? Do you do, how do you actually do consumer protection and, and disclosure policy when it's three clicks and boom, you get a loan? Right. So right. it's exciting, yeah. but it also makes me nervous. And so there's a lot of work that needs to happen yeah. on that front. And the UN is the better, better than Cash Alliance does work on that area as we do. Okay. So moving forward and looking at the future and the graduation um, program, you know, what do you see? Are you building on that project? Absolutely, because um, we, you know, I feel like we, 
we really got over a big threshold of just a kind of a proof of concept that there is this theory of a poverty trap to a lot of things, and we can see impacts at three years, and we actually, from the India site, we've seen positive results at seven years. We're going to do long-term follow-up on some of the others as well. But then there's a lot of questions that we still don't know the answer to about how to make this work better. Mm -hmm. Cost is a big issue. It is an expensive program. So when you want to take this to a country and, and try to work with them to roll this out as a policy for the country, take the, the weekly household visits. Maybe there's a way of making those monthly instead or even taking them out. Can you still have the same effect? Right. I don't know, but we can test. Right. We can, we can set up a study, so we're doing that in Ghana right now. One of the other lessons from the study that was important is that even though the, the results created these big treatment effects on average, but some people were helped a lot and other people just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So why? And so we're doing work to try to understand who is helped a lot and who is given all of these resources and then only really a little bit better off. Mm -hmm. What's going on that they're not able to seize these opportunities and run with them? Right. So in Ghana, we set up a study where we are rolling out cognitive behavioral therapy to work on de issues of depression and planning. And, mm -hmm. um, and we're doing that before the program, just before the program, and then roll out the program. And maybe that will help households seize the opportunity more. Mm -hmm. And so then maybe we'll see um, you know, the households that were only being helped a little bit, maybe that'll help them seize this opportunity and have a bigger, bigger effect for them. So that's another test we'll, we'll know right. in a couple of years, the results. Okay. So there's lots of questions like this that are important to know, um, that are important both for how to run the program better, how to run it at lower cost, um, and, and so that's the, kind of the next wave of the agenda on these projects. All right. We will look forward to hearing from you about that then. Great. Thanks. Thank you for being okay. here with us today. Thank you very much. And sharing some of your work. For more information about Professor Carlin and his research, please visit our website at macmillan.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Thank you.